I can see you from on the other side. So um, thanks everyone for uh, allowing me to uh, talk. My name is Joe George. I'm with uh, Texas Instruments. I've um, uh, been for years, from the 1990s actually. I'm actually a, a MIT alum, class of 90, 91 masters. So I uh, appreciate everybody uh, getting on here. Um, haven't talked in a while to Kurt. I'm glad he reached out and said, uh, yeah, what, what's uh, going on with, uh, with, with, with Texas Instruments IoT? So um, decided we'll go through some of the uh, um, some of the opportunities and, and some of the devices that are out there give you sort of updates. Um, all this is actually non-NDA information. Um, I think we've actually labeled it selective disclosure, which means, um, you know, I wouldn't put it on the external internet. There's nothing proprietary, but um, but but nothing wrong with, you know, sharing around, emailing it around and, and such. And if you need more data, we can always uh, give you NDA if you want, you know, stuff in more detail. The, um, and, and, and I guess I should have put a better agenda slide in here, but basically we'll go through Actually, we'll go through an adventure of, of, of basically IoT uh, solutions um, uh, from a TI standpoint. Along, uh, alongside there. So the first place that often we see uh, IoT, and I'm going to blast through this a little bit, is uh, is Bluetooth, um, and especially Bluetooth LE. People like using Bluetooth LE. Um, uh, there, there's a bunch of uh, CC devices out there, um, and this is actually a soft uh, um, marketing um release that we're having on a CC23 4X family. This actually, and I like to highlight, is supposed to be a, a sub $1 um, device that gives you, and let me, oops, um, gives you the ability, and you'll see this sort of slide from TI, one of our VPs that started a couple years ago wants almost every business unit to have this type of slide that gives you just a, a snapshot of what the, what the particular features are on a, on a particular D, uh, TI device. Uh, but this is a Cortex M0 based, uh, you know, system on a chip, um, uh, Bluetooth. We, you might have seen other devices out there, uh, CC26 uh, family, CC25 family. Um, this is our again uh, very cost-effective small package um, type device that we're coming out with. Um, Simple Link is sort of the, the the terminology we have for here on this particular particular SOC. Um, and then on the next slide, uh, we do have, uh, and again. Um, on the website right now, I'm going to blast through some of the the, the uh, animations here. But you can go to the CC2340 website um, on, on TI, and it'll give you uh, just do a search on 2340, um, and uh, you'll see uh, you know, sort of a teaser on some of the um, some of the features of the device that are out there. Are there any questions or comments on uh, on using Bluetooth? And that, and the whole point here is to make uh, you know Bluetooth uh, you know uh, very cost effective and be able to sort of, uh, you know, put the BLE down anywhere um, with, with, of course, you know, you know, uh, major power savings uh, uh, opportunities. So next to Bluetooth um, for IoT, of course, um, and people at first to say, we'll never do it. It's too much of a power hog would be, um, sorry, we turn the two windows here, um, is Wi-Fi. And at first you'll look at this and go, oops, click too fast. At first, you'll look at this and you'll go, oh, this is a great roadmap slide. Um, Joe, why are you wasting my time with, with, with uh, Wi-Fi 4? Um, actually, you guys can't see. Oh, there we go. There's my cursor. Why are you? Uh, you can see my cursor OK? Yeah, your cursor is fine, Joe. Um, you know, why are you wasting my time with, uh, with Wi-Fi 4? Um, you know, that's go to later to 11 ABGN. How about, wi you know, how about Wi-Fi 5 and 6 and 8 to 11 uh, AX? And, eight, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the reason we're showing this slide actually is sort of a sort of academic to, to sort of mention that the types of, of Wi-Fi devices that are out there, um, very similar to the BLE uh, SOC, we have you know what we basically call a Wi-Fi uh, MCU. Um, but at the same time too, there are devices out there, and, and the Wi-Fi MCU will have in, in this case Cortex M4 along with the radio and such, and you can run um, you know your your, your Wi-Fi stack. But sometimes you don't want to use, you know, the 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 the, the MCU that's on the, the particular Wi-Fi. Um, you just want you just want to add Wi-Fi. In that case, we do have Wi-Fi network processors, and you can add that here in the network processor. Usually, UART or uh, or um, SPI connection to whatever MCU or MPU that you have, and you basically get a TCP/IP um, stack and everything running on this device. Um, and and these though on the IoT world, there are usually lower lower speeds again to save power. So you might be, you know, 50 megabit, you know, 30 megabit, those those type of, you know, even though it is, you know, whatever Wi-Fi standard. Uh, when you want the faster speeds, then we get into more Wi-Fi transceiver. That's often a separate chip. Um, and you, some of you might be familiar with the Wi-Link 
um, world where um, which we've had for a while. It originally came from the cell phone world. So not only does it take care of, of, of doing your Wi-Fi, it also gives you Bluetooth um, and, and deals with coexistence and such uh, since, you know, you're running 2.4 uh, gigahertz both and don't want to have too much uh, um, too much congestion between there. So um, this is basically a Wi-Fi 4 portfolio. Um, and just to give you a, a, a closer look at what the block diagrams look like, like we mentioned, here's our, um, you know, our simple link again, where we said is a, a system on a chip. Um, it's got um, basically the application processor, which is the, the Cortex uh, M4. And again, here's our network processor. Um, actually, I should run the animation on here, where basically um, the network processor, um, you know, can can run um, uh, now, uh, um, you know, just this network processor you get by yourself, or use the MCU in this case, the Cortex M4, or as you see here, this. Um, uh, ends up being the, the transceiver by itself. Um, so those are sort of the, well, in two block diagrams, the, the three devices or the three uh, configurations that we talked about. Um, but what we're going to do in the future, and um, and again, real quick, we mentioned the, uh, yeah, 20 to 30 megabit is what you normally see for, for the SOCs and the network processor, again, with good power savings. Um, the Y-Link here does come from the cell phone world. So, um, but, you know, we do get, you know, around 100 megabit along with the Bluetooth. Um, and again, decent power savings, but, but uh, um, you know, the next generation, of course, that everyone is asking about is not the Wi-Fi 4 um, that we're talking about, 811 um, and, and and such, but going into, and maybe box to the rest of the animation, Wi-Fi 6. And you go, wait a minute, Wi-Fi 6, what happened to Wi-Fi 5, 802.11ac, um, or Wi-Fi 5 here? Um, we actually, TI decided not to do a device um, in that because it really wasn't IoT friendly. It's more uh, enterprise-based. Um, and it didn't really have the, uh, uh, you know, the power savings and stuff that we needed. Um, and so what happens with Wi-Fi 6, and we'll get to the next slide in a second, you'll see lower latency, you'll see, uh, uh, you know, better power numbers and such. Um, and just like, you know, 802.11n uh, and, and such, we got 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. But when we get into um, Wi-Fi 6, we're also, there's also a 6 gigahertz band. Um, and of course, things like security, WPA3 actually goes all the way back to N even if needed. And realize too, that 811AX, it is compatible with, with AC, again, giving you a lot of power and, uh, and, and latency advantages. Um, any questions? Oh, actually, more interesting probably into the sort of marketing slide is a bit more of the technical slide, slide right? Yeah. Showing, again, 811N, uh, which is pretty much, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Bob, did you have a question? Okay, I think I've turned it on. Can you hear me? Okay, could you hear, is this working? Yep. Okay, yep. Uh, the big thing for IoT at this point is everybody's doing 2.4 versus the pricing. So uh, if you can say something about pricing. Um, <laughs> not, not exactly. I mean, there's, there's definitely prices for the Y links up there. Um, I mean, you go to the TI website and just type in, uh, actually, let me show you the, the part number back here, uh, WL. Okay, you don't have uh, to answer it, but I just want to say when I'm looking at things, that's the number one issue I see that people make it. You need an ESP32 equivalent with wi with the new uh, Wi Fi. Okay, no, no, we've definitely heard, and that is our intention is, is to get to that level. We're probably not at that level with the Y Links and um, WL1837, which I don't see here. It's probably the uh, is the superset. Um, okay, you don't have to, to be labor, but I just want to make that point because it'd be very exciting to do that. So that is the intention, and again, uh, you'll you'll oops, uh, went too far. Here. Um, you'll see a device coming out um, probably middle of this year. Again, I had to give you stuff that was non-NDA at this point, but I can hint you'll see something in this world right here. Um, and the intention is definitely to have that be, um, you know, sub. Um, okay. I don't know if I can say sub. Low okay. Price. Let, let me just leave a link. I'd like to have a, a, an NDA discussion with you on that because it's directly okay, sure. central to things I'm trying to do. I think there's a lot of synergy there. Okay, gotcha. I know we definitely, definitely do. Just out of curiosity, what is the price that you're seeing now on the- uh, $2. Uh, on the SP4? $2, okay. I, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I, I think we're gonna be in that range, if not better. Uh, okay, you know, so if you can do that, you understand the market. Yeah, but, yeah no, and, and that's definitely an intention. Uh, quick, quick question there, what's the bandwidth um, on that, I assume? Uh, I don't for care. Two dollars, you're not at a hundred. You're not at a gigabit or something. No, th this the whole point of this is to turn on the light and stuff. These are very low traffic applications, but vital. Yep. 
so that's the exciting part. And I'll just say, and we'll discuss later, I'm very interested in the software as things like Tasmoda, Shelly make it much more programmable than the typical embedded system world. Yep, and what we've done actually is um, what will happen on the, on the transceiver, let me go back to here real quick. If you go on the transceiver side, um, actually, and you'll, you'll see the interaction with our, uh, our, our MPU in a minute, um, but, uh, sorry, one more, it's just going slow here. Okay, again, you go back to talk, but I just want to say, but we, I want to talk to make sure that it's a software platform as devices like the Shelly turn hardware into software. Yep, no, what's going to happen, oops, uh oh, did I just crash? <laughs> Great, I think my presentation just crashed. Um, here, let me get up again real quick. Um, but what is the simple link side, um, it, it's, it's a very simple SDK, um, and on the transceivers, and, and you know, even now that you get in way, when we get to the, uh, the transceiver, and and again, it's it's actually on the um, what do you call it? on on mainline Linux. You'll be able to get the drivers and such. Or you'll be able to get the, the future Wi-Fi six uh, drivers also. Um, good now. Okay. Again, I don't want to distract too much, but I'll put it this way: Ti missed an opportunity with the watch. I don't want to see them miss it this right. time. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. My it keeps dropping. I keep. Losing. I'm sorry. Which? You see, drop a little spin. I guess you can see my Google screen. But that's about it right now. Yeah, the first thing you should do is always do Windows D to hide everything. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry about the technical here. By the way, I assume you're local in Boston. Sorry, I'm. I don't know. Here we go. It's opening. Looks looks like we lost him. Oh, well, what a tragedy. He'll be back, I assume. Is he local, by the way, in Boston? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's in Arlington. He certainly doesn't work in Texas. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I'm, a, I'm actually excited about having a next generation of chips, but we have to make sure we get the software there. Yep. I, I had a question real quick. So, um, just can, like, um, I've been looking IoT wise. I've been looking for like a cheap transceiver that um, can transmit at other areas of the spectrum, like below two and a half gigahertz. Why? Um, mainly just for for ham radio stuff, or just just to play with uh, uh, digital modes, like like APRS. Um, Yeah, and like I've I've been looking online, but I didn't know if um, if anyone had any suggestions. Um, I think there are some SDR platforms. I haven't looked at it myself, but I think there are some relatively low cost SDR based. Um, yeah, looking on in general, I think yeah, most of the the solutions I've seen are just receiver based. Uh, in terms of SDR, but it's, mm -hmm. it seems like really hard to find an SDR-based transceiver. I know a lot of people do is that they just um, use an external one and just plug it into their sound card, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then do the um, the the 
analog to digital conversion uh, on their computer. Yeah. By the way, the picture behind you, they're going to start calling that a monocopter as a retronym. <laughs> oh, George, Joe's back. Uh, sorry about I'm back. Sorry about that. I luckily didn't have to reboot, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so all I was saying, Bob, is, yeah, so, so, the, so the intention here software-wise, SDK for the SOC and the network processor, you know, they'll hook up to other MCUs if needed. And then here on the transceiver side, um, we're in mainline Linux now with the WL1837 or the others. Okay, the future, well, yeah. uh, device also within mainline. I'm sorry? I, I, we can have a geek talk. I don't know whether this is the place where but we should just get together and I'll bring up the date on sort of my exploration of the SP32 world. And the, sure. the, the sort of the two worlds, there's the old and better system world using them, and there's a new sort of software device world. Okay, be curious to definitely curious to hear that. And to answer yeah. Bob's uh, question, that is a helicopter that's been restored. It was in my company in Vietnam. I actually flew it at one point. Oh, no, I, I appreciate that, but you also appreciate the, the, the retronym. You know, because everybody knows about quadcopters more than helicopters, so they have to call these monocopters. That's true. But yes, it's a, uh, yeah. okay, Joe. You're back up. So, continuing on with the, with the Wi-Fi six, not only will we have uh, the two point four and five gigahertz, but also uh, Wi-Fi six is also going to have a six gigahertz band. Um, of course, anyone who took uh, any of uh, you know 801, I mean uh, 6013 or 6014 knows that anything RF, right? You're going to basically, um, as you increase your uh, uh, the frequency band, you're going to have less range, uh, which is always a trade-off. But hopefully, anyone in an apartment complex, no one knows how to run a six gigahertz uh, uh, access point, so <laughs> you'll hopefully be the only one, uh, you know, on that particular frequency. Actually, this raises another important question. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi 6 power management. Are we going to be able to get adjust, adjustable power? Yeah, yeah, that's all That's all planned. Just like, uh, honestly, it'll be a model like the Y, uh, like the Y-Links um, in the same way. Okay, good, because that's um, another issue with Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, and that's why and that's why we are concentrating this on for IoT, right? And again, yeah, why we sort of skip the Yeah, world. it sounds like you're doing everything right, so that's why I'm excited to talk. Yep. Can we do it at the well, command? And then the can we do it at the command and prompt, so, like IW config, IW config power settings? For for Linux, yes. Um, and then actual, and then for when you look at the uh, the SOC, um, again, there's a whole simple link SDK that you run, you know, sort of from a main dot C type of thing. Great. Um, and then and then continuing on the Linux side, though, um, you know, if you're going to you know run a transceiver, you want some type of processor to run it with, right? And uh, for those of you that are familiar, um, and I'll, I'll show the diagram in a minute later, um, with the AM335, which has been out for about 10 years now, Beagle Bones, you know, all kinds of Beagle, et cetera, very popular device from, from TI. We're finally now entering the 64-bit world. Um, and, and this device is out there that you can actually get right now, the AM62. This is now the starter kit uh, EVM from TI, but there are Beagles, Beagles on the way, um, such that it'll be even lower cost. And one nice thing we've done with the starter kit is that not only are we giving you the the 64-bit processor, um, you know, and again, of course, all the uh, uh, you know all the other um, HDMI around it, so it almost looks like a Beagle. But ooh, I guess you can't see it well here. But there's also in this case a Y-Link on board, a WL1837, and you can imagine that um, you know once our uh, uh, our Wi-Fi six solution is out, you'll see a board that also has the Wi-Fi six. Um, and again, with the, with the mainline, well, eventually it'll it'll get to mainline Linux. Honestly, uh, obviously, initially you'll have to you know download a patch or something. But well, then, you know, hand in hand, how much memory on? On, the, on so I'm assuming this is a chip with the CPU and the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Uh, no, this is actually a single chip. Um, but actually, well, let me go to the similar to the AM335. The AM62 is basically you know up to quad core. Um, type of thing. It's got, I don't know if anyone's familiar with, with PRU, the programmable real time unit, uh, graphics engines. Um, oh, that's it's a complete system. Yes. Yeah. It's a complete system uh, uh, digital chip, 
Right, but then the Wi-Fi will be separate. Obviously, the memory is separate. I mean, there's RAM on board and caches and such, but then you'll be running, actually going, oops, going back to here, um, you'll probably run and run out of well, some type of PMIC, some type of codec. Oh, we did, a, oh, here we go. Uh, actually, they, they prefer, so, so DDR will be your volatile memory and something like an EMMC or even SD card is what you'll, you know, boot off of. Um, I know the Beagle Bones, we've been doing EMMC. I'm not sure what our, our future Beagle is going to have. Um, but nowadays, too, we're starting to put Quad Spy Flash, and we'll see in a minute why why we've got Quad Spy Flash here um, on top of, you know, other non-volatile. Hey, Joe, are you sharing a screen? We don't see it. Oh, you can't see? Um, are you the, the, uh, the screen share go away? Let me do it again. Are you able to see it now? Yes. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Um, so you, you saw this slide, right? Pre previous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so right now, uh, basically, we have the 802.11 um, you know, transceiver. You'll see the 802.11 AX come out. Um, and, and right now, right, ah, I keep going too fast. Uh, right now, you're able to get the the, the M uh, uh, 62x starter kit. Um, even we said again with a Y link, and you'll see that which is the Wi-Fi 4. You'll see the Wi-Fi 6 coming out. Um, and here's the memory we mentioned, right? So here's a DDR4 for for non-volatile, um, I mean for volatile, and then either EMMC, micro SD, or we'll, we'll talk in a minute why we have a quad a quad spy flash here potentially. Uh, and of course, just like a Beagle, you know, we have HDMI. Um, you know, that, that you can uh, use, you know, connect USB if you want. And, you know, I have sitting in the lab right now, one of these set up, um, actually running um, uh, a, a version of Chromium. Uh, we want to do some animations and such on Chromium. So we're using that right now um, in our lab. And, and by the way, most of these things are now all powered by, uh, you know, some type of USB uh, power. Uh, this sort of got more popular. So, um, and where this comes from is uh, sort of the Beagle world was AM335, right? This is a 64, uh, this is a 32-bit ARM. Now we've got a 64-bit ARM. Well, this is what I was mentioning earlier. Um, up to up to quad core at this point would be the superset, but also got cut down. Um, and this is sorting sort of differentiations between the AM335 and the AM62. The big thing, of course, is the 64-bit core. Um, but a lot of the other uh, stuff is sort of a, you know, almost a, a you know a PC on the chip type of thing. So continuing on, um, uh, no chip is good if you don't have software, right? So out of the box, we've got uh, Linux. Obviously, this is a slightly old slide. Actually, Android is available now, and also real time Linux, um, all available now. So this is a slightly uh, old slide. Um, but one point that I wanted to bring up. Um, which maybe I should have gone on the slide before. Well, here is that um, when you look at the AM62, and we didn't do as good of a job of this on the AM55, you've got the you know Cortex A um, running processor SDK in whatever particular Linux, but we also have MCUs on board. And you go MCU, where did I see an MCU? Going back to this block diagram, um, some of this is coming sort of from from a safety world. Um, we have right here uh, a Cortex M4F. And um, uh, FFI actually stands for free, uh, free from interference. And the whole point of FFI is this Cortex M4 is running as a separate MCU, completely independent um, power tree, you know, internally, right? Power tree resets, etc. So your Linux can crash, and if it, if it, even if it does, your Cortex M4 F is still running. Um, and so this is sort of coming from a little bit, uh, honestly, from the automotive world. Um, where we've also got uh, R5Fs on certain devices. This particular one is is the Cortex M4F. And so, how do you program that along with the with the Linux or RT Linux or whatever? That's why we've split into two SDKs. We've got the you know Linux or Android or or whatever running on your Cortex A, and then on your Cortex M, you're going to go ahead and run this MCU SDK. 
which is running free RCOS. Some versions do have a bare metal. Um, I think we're, we're pushing more people to use free RTOS as things get more complicated. But no more long, no, so we have so, sort of two separate SDKs running um, with all these different devices that are out there. And um, uh, what's interesting is we don't show it here, but we even have some inner processor communication mailboxes, et cetera. So a bunch of, of packages that makes it easy. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen AM62 is the more cost effective one. There's an AM64 device out there um, that, that's available also, also, you know, running this um, not, not as uh, not as friendly when it comes to display and things like that. It's a bit more of a, of, of a headless device. So continuing um, um, with the software side, um, this is sort of the TI world when we talk about processors. Uh, AMC2 is the most cost-effective solution. There's a bunch of other families out there. Some of the R5S and stuff actually come from uh, just into a sort of an automotive world. Um, and that's why we do have some of these free from interference. It's more of a, it was a safety. Um, and some of those are, are have, have been pushed from here and down to what we call Satara MPU. Um, in general, when you think, you know, microprocessor, right, you're thinking something that's running, you know, hundreds of megahertz, if not gigahertz, doesn't have onboard uh, flash typically. Um, there's another world, of course, that we, we talked about with MCU. And we'll see in a minute what Satara MCU is. I think in general, when we use the term MCU, we mean a microcontroller, right? We, we expect some type of onboard flash. So even though you have all these things in your IoT system, there might be, you know, something that needs um, a little bit of housekeeping, if that's the right word. Um, and that's sort of what our MSP world is, right? Uh, in our MSP, you find, you know, functions like you need an external RTC or you need, you know, some type of extra you know, PWM or uh, something like that going on or you know, a wake-up controller, et cetera. So just letting you know that uh, there are uh, the MSP430 families out there, again, very good for power, so, you know, good for RTC. And you can actually find, um, you, know, you know, I should have put the link in here, um, but basically the code is, you know, readily, readily available, um, again, with this, you know, training and even an ebook that then gives you the code and the software, you know, for basically just running this RTC function, you know, along with the PDF and such. So hopefully making it easier to you know, you know, not look at these MCUs as a device, but look at them as as a function that you need to get, you know, working with the rest of your your IoT system. Um, and then this is just showing you, um, you know, uh, multiple multiple types of packages, memory, etc., a wide variety. Are, are people familiar with the with the MSP four thirty family? around, um, actually it was originally called mixed signal processors, what the MSP stood for. Um, it was a big deal back in, there was actually TI Germany that came up with adding A to Ds and such on, on, a, on a microcontroller. Um, but something else that is sort of a, uh, um, a, a soft uh, release that we're doing is uh, some customers have looked at something, you know what, we don't want to use a 16-bit, you know, TI, um, I, I hate the word proprietary core, I think it's a non-standard core. Um, they say we want to use, uh, use an ARM. Um, and, and again, we've just right, we showed you this. We've got all the all the uh, collateral and, and development kits and et cetera um, for for MSP 430. But we also have coming out um, what we call the MSP M0. Um, and there is a soft release. You can actually go to like MSP uh, M0 L1305. You can see the data sheet right now. And what that is is basically uh, Cortex M0 um, that's in the MSP. Uh, uh, infrastructure or whatever you want to call it. So very low power, you know, use the same TI code composer, but now it is a 32-bit ARM instead of uh, a 16-bit 430. And um, I actually like this slide because it actually shows you sort of the breadth of, of TI uh, processors that are out there. You know, the high-end MPUs we talked about, right, that have some type of virtual memory manager and you can run Linux and, you know, high-level operating systems and such all the way down to you know, uh, I mean, this this is, is is supposed to compete, and again, you can go and see the price on on, the, on this thirteen oh five is is pretty pretty down there. But start to compete with sort of those eight bit eight bit, 8 -bit MCUs out there. So in the middle, and I, I hinted about this before, you see something called a Satara MCU. You go, what the heck does that mean? An MCU means you had onboard flash, but then a Satara, from what we understand so far, is is you know an MPU. You know, you know, what is that all about? And this is a device that's come out and actually AM2434 uh, is one you can go look at right 
now. And that's basically, think of it as, uh, you know, uh, an AM62 that doesn't have the Cortex-A. And instead, what we're giving you is a bunch of uh, the Cortex-M to R's, depending on this device. You can see the same M4F is here, but there's no Cortex-A here. You're not going to run a high-level operating system. Instead, you're going to, you know, basically, but, but a bunch of MCUs to run, um, again, PRU and a lot of the other peripherals that you've seen. And the beauty of this is you're running, you know, at, at this point, up to 800 megahertz. So this is a very powerful MCU running free RTOS, not running Linux or, or anything. Um, again, some of the same interprocessor communications. Uh, and by the way, um, when that Wi-Fi 6 um, comes out, you'll see not only are we running in Linux, but we're going to run basically Wi-Fi 6 off of one of the Cortex-R5s if you want. Uh, just a side, I actually like, uh, I like not having to put up with a stupid operating system. You know? mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, getting to the uh, sure, it, sure. And iron the, is something I do periodically. So very good, again. So, so you have the choice to do it either way. What you'll see is uh, if you're using M24, we get the little launch pads. Um, we'll connect to a booster pack, or again with a with, with the SK, you'll, there's an adapter. Eventually, we'll spin the own board, but it uh, gives you the, the be able to do the Wi-Fi again with lower power. Um, and compared to an MSP430 or something, you know you've got some serious you know peripherals and such here if you need you know quads. Oh, and by the way, that, that's why well we have an octal spies that we show here but that's why you have a quad spy or aqua spy that's for booting up the uh the mcus and the last slide i had to show and i'm glad i'm a little i'm, I'm pleasantly surprised but um um i don't know or appreciative no one's bugged us uh about supply because <laughs> that's obviously been something that uh customers have had problems with the last couple of years um and i've got a link here for you you can see the fact that um, some of this digital stuff, even the M35, um, TI acquired a, a, a fab uh, from Micron actually in Utah. That's actually in less than a year up and running. They're actually already spinning, um, I think, the C2000 devices out of there. Obviously, we've got Dallas, um, and and uh, you have to go to this link here because um, these are all digital, uh, pretty much in this case, connectivity. Um, but even there's some analog um new fabs and Sherman Texas for them are going to be built. So actually, if you go to this link right here, it talks about Lehigh, but if you go to the bottom, you'll see there's uh, more talk about other TI fabs that are coming out there. So um, this is all uh, uh, basically TI capital um, that uh, um, that we're using to basically build fabs and not have any supply issues anymore. So wondering if you had, that was, that was it for me. I don't know if you have any other questions or comments. No, this was great, Joe. I think what we might do, Jabber is going to want a copy of the slides if if you're allowed to uh, depersonalize them and send them. Or are we allowed to get a copy of your slides? Yeah, no, I can definitely uh, send the slides. It does say selective disclosure. Uh, and the only reason it says that is, yeah, I mean, don't post it on like a public website that anybody can get to type of thing. But well, definitely sharing it once yourself. This video will be posted. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. might want to modify that. But it's it's low <laughs> res, though, so that's okay. Okay. Right, right, right. So. Okay. And I mean, there's there's not, no, yeah. Send me your email address. So the blue at bob.ma. Okay. Yeah. Can do. So I think we're going to want to pivot to Shankar. I, I wanted to get Shankar on so that he could get off at eight o'clock, too. Um, if you want to hang out for a bit, Joe. Uh, we can keep the Q&A going in the chat and polls because I actually had a bunch of questions about uh, bygone standards. We had a, um, an IEEE mesh working group uh, uh, member come and talk to BLU once. And I don't think anybody's implemented that. I don't think Meraki implemented it. Not, not the IEEE standard anyhow. But, uh, but yeah, if you have to split. I know you've got, a, I know you've got some business tonight. So we'll get, we'll get you and Shankar on and off so that you can go make your uh, Zoom calls in time. Okay, I'll, I'll be on for about 20 minutes and, uh, and, and I'll watch before I prep for the 8 o'clock. Okay, cool. You, are, are, you up, uh, are you ready, Shankar? Yep. Uh, just, uh, just one other thing I want to clarify. Uh, uh, Joe, did you say that we uh, cannot post your slides on our website? If it's an external anybody can get to, I'd rather not. That's why it says a selective disclosure. Um, I could probably give you a version that would be very minimal that's only only the public information. I'm trying to think uh, what's on here. 
Yeah, I guess there's nothing really horrible on it. It just says selective disclosure. So, uh, I mean, it, you're saying it's something public, any, public anybody can get to. Uh, that is true. Uh, when it's on our website, anyone can see it. You know what we could do, Joe? We could put put a link to your blog post because you have a IoT video on the TI blog. Yeah, no, that's fine. That that that's definitely be a good start. I mean, if, I, if I email it to you, uh, Kurt, I mean, you can send it to everybody on the call, right? Yeah, we could do that. And then I'll just, okay. for the public disclosure stuff, I'll just put your TI blog posting. So that's that's already public. Yeah, no, yeah, no I think that's perfect. Now, the, the, the reason we like to put the slides on our website is because uh, sometimes we want to, uh, like, refer back to some meeting we had, like, a year or two or 10 years ago. And uh, if it's external links, uh, well, most of the time, those don't exist anymore. So if there's something like no, no. Oh, but it would be okay to release it a year from now. Uh, uh, maybe well, you know, you know what I can do. I think some of the stuff, some some of the the hints that I gave you guys about the Wi-Fi six and stuff, that's probably what they don't want up there. I could pull some of those off. You know what? You know what? I'll, I'll, so I'll send you two. I'll send Kurt two versions. I'll send one which is you know just you know to, to share amongst themselves. They'll say selective disclosure, and I'll pull out some of the uh, some of the Wi-Fi six stuff out of there that you know that could be objectionable. Um, and uh, and then and, and have it more clean, uh, and that won't have anything. I mean, you can post that. <laughs> with, with that, that okay, with, John? Yeah, um, yeah, that, that sounds good. Uh, one other thing, though, is um, would, would there be any possibility that uh, maybe we could uh, have a copy of it that we don't post for a year or two and, until it's okay? Uh, probably, yeah. Once all these devices are released, uh, uh, yeah, that, I mean, that should be done. Then you can put the selective disclosure. At that point, it'd be old data, so. Because all that will be on the external website. Okay, that would be great. Thanks. Okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll mark it that way. Yep. Okay, so now Shane Carr can do his talk. Thanks, guys. Take care. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll be listening in without the video on. Uh, all right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. So for those that don't know me, I'm Shankar Vishwanathan. I work at um, AMD. Um, I mostly focus on uh, performance architecture stuff, but I've also dabbled a little bit in security and soft, some of the software stuff. And <clears throat> this topic is somewhat tangential to the overall theme of um, IoT, uh, but uh, just something that uh, maybe some of you find um, find interesting uh, in in how uh, these SOCs today are effectively all multi ISA um, under the hood. So, uh, just kind of to uh, set the stage for what I'm talking about, like you know, typical uh, modern systems on chip, like not necessarily for uh, very, very low power devices, but uh, other IoT-ish devices that you would find on um, what they call the edge these days um, that has, you know, um, some number of CPU cores, potentially uh, GPU, um, and then perhaps, uh, you know, some combination of multimedia encode, decode, or a little bit of um, a neural processing unit uh, for, for inference. And then, uh, you know, most of these um, SOCs will have some kind of subsystem that handles the security um, and then the, the power and the thermal uh, management. And then, um, obviously, you have various um, I.O. controllers, you know, GPIOs or uh, PCIe, USB, what have you, and then some kind of memory. So, and then all of these kind of get hooked together uh, using uh, uh, either a single network on chip or network of networks. So um, this is, you know, the typical uh, kind of um, SOC that you would find, you know, in any Apple, AMD, Intel, you know, um, chips um, these days. Um, same thing with a bunch of the cell phone um, things, you know, Qualcomm or, or Samsung, MediaTek, uh, most of these um, SOCs that you have will have some architecture that is, you know, 
that looks like this. If you kind of squint at it, it'll look like this. So what am I saying when when uh, when these each of these SOCs is is multi ISA? So when you think about it, you know you have a, you have one or more CPU cores, and um, depending on the device, that could be you know x86 or or some flavor of ARM, uh, Risk Five, um, etc. And then if you have a if you have a GPU, um, GPUs are nothing but like big arrays of uh, SIMD units, which is single instruction, multiple data streams. So so these are uh, you know highly parallel um, floating point units effectively, and so uh, most of them have uh, vendor specific. Um, ISAs. So already, if your chip has a CPU and GPU, you have two ISAs um, uh, right there. Uh, and then, um, so a lot of the other units, um, like the multimedia engine, for example, could have uh, multiple DSP processors uh, for, for audio uh, processing and then for video encode or decode. So they have their own little controller and that runs its own um, code. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, the neural engine, depending on, you know, whose engine it is, it's, it's a, a variety of ISA. Some of them, uh, like, for example, uh, some of them use RISC-5, you know, others have their own proprietary um, um, ISAs. Or ISA, by the way, I, I mean instruction set architecture for those who are not familiar with that term. Uh, I should have set that up in the beginning. Uh, and then for the system management, this is what I was talking about for, you know, like thermal management or, or power management in general. Uh, you know, in the past, um, these used to be, um, this used to be uh, done using various hardware state machines, and then they would get inputs from uh, from the like the temperature sensor and things like this, uh, but after a while they became very limiting, and uh, if you had a bug in, uh, in somewhere, uh, you know there's nothing you could do once the chip came out. Uh, and then the other problem was that you know you couldn't really optimize it a whole lot um, after the chip came back. So a lot of these there was some limited programmability in terms of registers, um, but it became very difficult to tune um, the system for maximum you know, um, uh, efficiency, as in performance per watt. So um, most vendors basically switch to using some kind of microcontroller uh, to do this um, system management. And these could be from ARM, Tensilica, AVR, PIC, any of those uh, that, can, that are basically get embedded as IP within the system management um, subsystem. And uh, so now you've basically taken something that used to be um, state machine and turned it into code. Um, and so now it's a more flexible. Um, you can you can implement a variety of different algorithms. Um, you could have application specific uh, algorithms, right? If you're playing a game, you choose one profile. If you're um, you know running something compute heavy on the CPU, you could choose a different profile. So it becomes a lot more flexible, but that means there's another microcontroller and more code running on that. Uh, and then, you know, um, IO controllers have their own uh, microcontroller. So um, I think if you, uh, I mean, just Joe spoke about some of this, like they, they embed their own microcontrollers um, in that design and they run the, the TCP IP stack or, or the whole Bluetooth stack. So, um, they have their own microcontrollers and their own ISAs. So already, if your system has you know three or four of these, uh, you're talking of a handful of uh, of different ISAs um, uh, and so different types of code running within um, the same system. So you know where does um, all this code live? No? So for for CPU, it's kind of obvious. It's in your boot code and then the OS and all the applications. Uh, drivers, everything um, that you run. Um, for the GPU, the the ISA, the code that runs uh, the GPU ISA, um, that can be um, um, included in the driver, or oftentimes it's it's uh, emitted by some kind of just-in-time um, compiler. 
and and the and the jitted code is the one that actually runs on those uh, floating point units um, in the GPU. Uh, for other engines like the multimedia engine or the neural network engine, um, the code would be um, loaded um, by the driver of that engine um, into um, the RAM, or sometimes the code can be baked into the ROM within the within the system. So. Uh, um, these uh, the, these snippets or, or code for these engines would would typically, you know, when you install the driver, it gets put on your disk and then it gets loaded uh, when the engine is initialized. Uh, for system management, uh, um, that code is uh, generally bundled with the system boot code, so like BIOS, for example, or UEFI, or or uh, those kinds of platform management code. Uh, and uh, this uh, oftentimes will run independently of everything else that the OS is doing. Uh, and then uh, there might be other firmware um, uh, bundled in for other kinds of, uh, like the IO controllers and things like that. They may either live in the BIOS or the OS um, drivers. So um, it, it varies. Um, but, you know, um, what the, the, all these different ISAs are all running in parallel when when you're doing using your system basically. Uh, and so uh, you might say like, what is the complication from from having um, having these different types of uh, cores, which are different uh, engines running different ISAs? So uh, each of them can have different expectations um, with respect to uh, memory ordering, like what happens, you know, if you have uh, a few different memory operations, what should be the relative ordering between them? And each um, each CPU, each microcontroller can have different expectations. Uh, and then depending on how uh, the system is designed and how the network on chip operates, um, some of the cores may have caches and those uh, will be um, hardware coherent with the others and others may not and may just uh, look like some kind of scratch uh, memory and not be coherent with the, with the rest of the system. So the last level cache and the uh, network on chip uh, and the memory controllers have to understand um, all these different requirements of each of these um, sort of subsystems um, and uh, and make sure that those ordering requirements and those coherency requirements are met. Um, so this is the last slide. Um, takeaways: you know, heterogeneous ISA chips are are in the present and the future. I don't think they're we're going to go away from that. And you may not realize that any app that you're running um, on your laptop or or phone. Um, is inherently multi-ISA under the hood. Um, so that's it. Any questions? Fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shankar. OK, Kurt, if there's no more questions, you can go next. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Shankar. I know you were. You also have another business meeting yeah. tonight. Um, I will be around for another half an hour, twenty minutes maybe, and then I have to go. Okay. Well, we might. I know he only has a, a couple of minutes worth of material to speak. We might get uh, Brian Smith on here because he, um, among other things, he is another IoT fester. He was around. I'm thinking IoT Fest 2015, maybe Brian. Um, and among his other claims to fame is uh, he hosted an Orlando FOSS conference where one, one of his guests, one of his keynote speakers was BLU's very own Federico Luchafredi. So, uh, so Brian has a good nose for talent. Uh, quick, quick note on that. I think I'm in a read only mode today. Uh, rough day at work. So I'm uh, here enjoying the uh, content. Okay. Well, we'll put on somebody else. Uh, let me see. We actually had way more people say they had <laughs> they could they could present than than. Uh, luckily, they're they're all um, uh, 
they're all going to be mostly lightning talks. Um, but we're saving them to the end. We're saving Professor Jelinski and his students to the end. And probably um, DeLacy, too. I don't even see him. Um, so I think that either puts Garv Mitra or possibly uh, Bob next in line. Bob, do you want to, do you have a, a five or 10 minutes you can share with us? Uh, let me turn on. Okay. Well, the talk I have is longer than that, but instead of playing the video, I can do a, a quick run through and skip over the stuff for this audience. So let me see if I, if I can get PowerPoint to work. And basically, this will be a modified version of my talk, an abbreviated version. So the adventure begins. Uh, share. Let's see. Okay. First... Okay, now, if, if somebody wants to talk while I'm doing this, I'm still figuring this out, how to do it. Yeah, go ahead, BD. Yeah, it looks like Brian. Oh. <laughs> it's like, hey, somebody new. <laughs> On the side, is there anybody who knows how to share a PowerPoint this way? I can hear a video, but the PowerPoint is harder. The bottom of the screen, you have a little dot, dot, dot. screen with an arrow. Arrow? I see dot, dot, dot. To the, to the left of that. I think to the, just to the right of the camera icon. Oh, st oh, there it is. OK. Oh, OK, there it is. There's a screen I can share. Um, share. Is that working? Yep. Yeah. We're working perfectly, Bob. Okay, I'll give it a try. Okay. Um, as I said, this is a talk I'm trying to prepare, and it's still a draft. So if I can click, no, I got to find the screen. PowerPoint it works in its own way. Somewhere there's a PowerPoint screen, controller screen. Okay, I, I, I'll do it this way. So I won't go, okay, the main point of this, again, skipping through, is that we encode things with alphabets, that the information is not there. And that a the hardware-centric view is about the hardware, and I'm a software guy, so zero and one is just one encoding, but the point is these are not physical things. So once we get past the limitation of the physical understanding of software, for example, a QR code can connect uh, things just like, you know, Wi-Fi. It's just it's the same kind of idea, the way we use a medium. So the main potential point here is this agree screen. And most people are not bothered by the agree screen. Um, I'm looking to the side, but that's where it is on my screen. Um, be, and the difference is those of us who actually build things, our devices can't get past it. So, oh, actually, I should have begin by saying I hate the term IoT. There is connectivity. It's not different from the net or the web. But what is different is that these screens prevent devices from connecting. So this is the key point. This is my home. Actually, it's behind me if you turn the camera on. And it looks messy, but I don't see the mess. All I, I can focus on just two devices and ignore the rest. And that's the key thing about connectivity. I connect things with symbols, and it doesn't matter what all the crap between is. That'll offend the, the, the telecom people, but you know, their time is coming and gone. And the key thing is that ESP chip, and I hope the TI chip is just as cheap and powerful and more powerful than that, because that's a pretty old chip. So that's what puts intelligence in the devices. And of course, I could take it anywhere in the world and they stay connected. Now, physically, the current internet makes it hard, but it can put shims in to get around that as long as I don't hit those uh, agree screens. And of course, they can be devices. It could be a pill bottle. And nice thing about that pill bottle as an example is that's a few dollars too. So all the pill bottles you see at CES are very expensive because they have to justify the cost of negotiating. If we take an infrastructure approach, then uh, we remove the, all the problems of cost of negotiating. 
And the key thing, getting ahead of myself, is this concept of ambient connectivity, where we could focus on the relation between the devices and not worry about the technical term is the crap in the middle or the crap between. So this is the old school where you actually had to send a message between the two points and had to travel the wire. And basically that's a string between two tin cans because the phones were no smarter than the tin cans. They were just a microphone and a speaker. And the right model is the post office. You're carrying messages. And telephone calls used to be measured in uh, message units, which are telegrams. So the new model is we have smart sound devices and we don't need somebody carrying them for us. Instead, we need generic packet infrastructure. And here's the key point. Voice over IP is a fundamental disconnect from what we had in the past. It, it, it does, did not come out of telephony. It does not operate on telecom principles. Instead, we take the word hello, we encode it in packets, throwing away the complete knowledge of the word hello. None of those packets have any meaning. Anybody looking at the packets can't find the meaning there. So that where so it can you cannot apply a message carrying algorithms or policies. You cannot fix a problem. If you lose a packet, you can't replace it. So none of the, the very idea, the fundamental concept of telecommunication networks goes away. So if you want to talk about it, use the term IoT. It's about the relationship between the devices without worrying about the crap in the middle or the between. And you know the phone company couldn't this model could not give us picture phone, even after half a century of trying. Yet the VoIP not only does voice, it does video. So the key thing now that we need in order to do connected devices is infrastructure as a resource. That we don't want networking as a service and depending on something in the middle, but instead we want a shared physical infrastructure. But the key idea is that infrastructure is not a network. It is not the network, it's facilities. The networking is what we do with it using software. The internet is one implementation, but anything else can be. So this the key thing is that once we have packets, we can do anything. The internet is good, a good basis because it gives a packet infrastructure, but it doesn't give us stable names, DNS expires, IP address, ephemeral. So it's a work in progress. I think it was a transitional form. But the elephant in the room, of course, is that we view it through the legacy of the past. We have these old ideas like stacks. The ISO stack is a terrible design principle. It's what we tell children, you know, but it's not something for real design. And the other thing is 5G that's coming to drag, it's sort of like the hand out of the grave dragging us back to the past. Because 5G is basically the SS7 model where the phone companies were charging for network as a service because the design point of SS7 was to provide a clear path, take the resource away, and what it got in return was circuits busy. So instead of taking a layering model, we take a resource model. And MB connectivity views all the infrastructure as a resource, and you don't worry about the details, you just design assuming it. Now, so why do we frame today's thinking? We, well, if you go back, to the 93rd and World's Fair, we already had the smart city. It was a central office with index cards. We also had self-driving cars, versus the highways were guideways, which is a much better idea than we have now. And then the ultimate design point is the Jetsons, because obviously that's the future. So that's how we got into the term, like maybe LA made load register A and turned to Opco 75. So it was very close to one-to-one -to -one uh, to the machine instructions. And then people started doing fancy macro assemblers. And then they did these programs which could take seeming high level instructions, but they cost by the machine code. So that's why I call C, sugared assembly language. It doesn't get you far enough away from the machine, but it was basically BCPL version two. Okay, back to the talk. So uh, as I explained, the problem, I'll, I'll go back one. I don't wanna go back more. Telecom was funded by charging for a service of phone calls and the strain between the two tin cans was a cost center. Uh, that model does not work once we have intelligence in our devices. So 
since the money's not going to pay for the infrastructure, first we tell children's stories. You're really paying for a phone call. You're not. But, you know, people will believe anything you tell them. But ultimately, we had to drop piles of money on the broadband infrastructure because the old business model didn't work. The answer is not to do that. The answer is to recognize that we have a common infrastructure that we should pay for, just like we pay for sidewalks and roads, the public packet infrastructure. And there's nothing new about a public packet infrastructure because your home network, your campus, your offices are shared packet infrastructures. Now, would you get at this? So this is a slide from my Trilby magazine on all these IoT projects, and this is in, Indi in India, but it could be anywhere. And it's complicated because you got to worry about which radio, where, and what radio, what characteristics, and everything. No wonder nothing happens. This is far, far too complicated. But we can simplify it if we just put a Wi-Fi, you know, stick, glue a cell phone to a cow, or maybe you could do a little better than that. Uh, because for lions, they wear collars now with with radios and I think cell phone accounts because lions deserve a cell phone account. Unfortunately, cows don't, which is a problem with this model. So, but if we take an infrastructure approach, all that cost disappears. We can put a $2 radio on there, TI uh, or ESP, and we're done. And we can then apply that to many cows. There's no additional cost. We can do tractors. We can drop things on fields. We can do all sorts of things because each of them is a project that an individual or small group can do without having to negotiate, without having somebody second guessing them all along the path. And this is why these small chips, and I look forward to the TI version, are very powerful. And remember, the ESP was a few years old, so we've really advanced a lot since. So the, so the combination means we need a fundamental different approach and infrastructure that enables innovation without having to negotiate everywhere we are for a new account. And it's, remember, it's not just the individual building chips. All those cloud services that complement the local thing, you don't have to, now key architects, you don't depend on them, but you can use them. Those are now limited in what they can do because there's a toll booth between the endpoints that's saying, no, you can't do it unless you pay. And 5G is just that toll booth, you know, put back because the internet got rid of it. 5G is trying to put it back. So just say no. So now we can have any number of these devices anywhere and really scale up because we're no longer the traditional limits. And okay. So we can go through the cost. There's basically cost nothing to put this infrastructure in. We're used to giving roads away for free, but when we put broadband, which is cheaper. It's like a payday loan. You can never pay it off. And same for the 5G thing, which is, again, there's a conflict of interest of the service providers also offering the infrastructure. So a key thing about 5G is they want to put their service, network virtual services and software-defined networks is really a scam to basically have you use their data centers, not other people's. In the meantime, a MIMO radio can cost just, you know, put a Wi-Fi thing up for a few bucks. I put a thousand dollars to include the people rolling a truck out, putting it up. But basically, you just buy it to put them everywhere, and we get complete coverage. So the trick is to make it happen. And you know, it, it, MIT does have open networking, but people fight; they're scared of it. So the real problem is the Pogo thing. We are the enemy because you can implement connectivity locally. You buy a pipe through telecom, just as you buy a broadband pipe to connect your house. And then cities can interconnect and they coalesce and then we achieve flashover, which is an infrastructure. And then all these chips really turn the world into software and we can just start implementing without having to ask permission. Of course, there's going to be chaos and a mess, but we're getting a handle on how to do it. So some of the legacy ideas like firewalls will keep for a little while uh, to coexist while we create this open infrastructure and then have things connected health and all sorts of innovation. So. Okay, so I'm back. And I did that in only 15 minutes. Yeah, we've got some time. We um I I told I told Josh 8:15, so we've still got some time. Okay, I mean, I I, I raced through if you want to get a rec recorded version which is much longer because I'm aiming at an audience that does not have as much background, so I go into a lot more detail. Actually, uh, Bob, you think you should do another talk on this in April? What? Do another one? Yeah, in April we uh, don't have anyone scheduled yet, so. Um... 
I could, uh, yeah, I hopefully I might, and I might be able to work with the IEEE on a more professional version, but if you want the URL for this version, I, I really could use feedback. So I put the URL in the chat. But any questions, nostalgia, anything? Um, By the way, you see the table behind me there. Yeah. No, I started, I did a lot of assembler programming back when. Yeah, I have to say, I'm scared of assembler now because the chips have really changed their nature with highly parallel and all these things. So, uh, you know, the world of assembler programming has changed. So I think one of the important points about assembler is how simple it was. It was a very, the 6502 was so simple. I could wrote it one night uh, when I was at ECD, the only machine we had working was in New York for a show. So I wrote, a, I wrote an emulator that night, debugged my program, which was a, a, ba a fancy basic, shipped it to New York and it ran. But didn't those Motorola chips couldn't do division in hardware, right? You had to write something to do division and multiplication? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was not much of the Motorola chips, but I, I suspect that there was some hardware assist. The real machine was the IBM 1620 Model 1, which couldn't even do addition. It had to do table lookup to do addition. How many 1620 programs are here? Am I showing my age? No, my first, uh, my first assembler was uh, PDP-8. Well, that was a contemporary. That was a little after, but yeah. Actually, I never really did <coughs> PDP-8 programming. I was familiar with it, but um, I never really programmed the PDP-8. I don't think I did. Yeah, I worked at Burger King. We had uh, our point of sale system was PDP-8s. You oh, couldn't right. see the PDP-8. It was under the table, but uh, yeah. PDP-8M. Yeah, after Dan Brickman left DAC, he was doing a point of sale system for Carl, Carl Jr.'s in the late 70s. And they are still in business. Yes. Now, I mean, it, it, it's the nice thing, and this is one of the things, is some of us are fortunate to grow up while these machines are very simple. So as these innovations happen, we learned each one. And I don't see how a kid coming up now, when you, you look at GPT, and you want to say, yes, but if you go down with a soldering iron and work your way up, you can see how all that happened. And you really understand the machine at a deep level. So I've got to say, the, it's becoming harder and harder to you know, trace out that path. I took, um, I took an assembly class, I think last summer. Um, and the hardest part for me was, was changing my thinking. Um, <laughs> And learning how to think how the processor parses instructions. And um, one thing that, that occurred to me was that, you know, using oh, today's I mean, debuggers, I can't imagine how you would have debugged stuff back in, in the 80s. Oh, was, uh, well, first, one of the programs I wrote was a debugger, which okay. can handle assembly language as well as PL1 and COBOL. So that would show you where, like the where the where the stack was in the memory, and um, well, you can look at it. That was just the there. Data. In other words, yeah. I mean, if you wanted to see what was on the stack, you just looked at the the, the stack. Uh, it was much simpler. Now, I mean, there was some magic. For example, in Visual Studio, the first time I could go back, that was amazing. You know that you could undo things. But for the most part, it, I mean, in a sense, right now, if you debug in Node, you can't go back. So you just put breakpoints, you put print statements in. In that sense, it's not that much different. It was just the main thing is that I'm trying to give the, the sense of it. A lot of it was your mindset. So you'd think in terms of the operations, and yes, you'd have to put in each of the detailed instructions. But there were idioms, so it wasn't necessarily th that, you know, much harder. It was just more tedious. Yeah. Then, uh, how many how many registers did you have to work with? Well, <laughs> it, it, it's a question. I mean, the number of registers wasn't as much the issue because it was actually the sixty five or two. I think at two and a half. 
I have to remember, like X, Y, and A indexing, uh, but they're 8 bit. So, you know, you'd also treat other, you know, you use memory more. So, interesting thing on a stack machine, you don't even think in terms of registers. So, it was not a major issue. In fact, on the um, IBM 360, there were 16 registers, and that was a pain. Because if some fool puts something in register seven and you were looking at a piece of code locally, how are you supposed to know that 10 pages before you, the register seven was taken? So one of the things about assembly, you, you know, you rapidly learn to really structure your code. Or at least, I'm oh, sorry, some of us learned. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, other people would say, oh, branch instruction. I can, who needs to waste a byte storing a flag? I can modify the branch instruction in line. And it took a while to stamp out that way of thinking. Yeah. Well, I had, uh, when I was at the bank, I inherited a program that was originally written in Assembler, an IBM Assembler, and converted to Burroughs COBOL. And nobody would touch it and so they gave it to me and i looked at it and i looked at the underlying assembler it was mm -hmm. ibm assembler i understood what the underlying stuff was <laughs> and but, it was automatic a lot of the conversion to cobalt was automated it was not by hand so it was really, really complicated. Well, yeah, it, it sounds like somebody, it, I mean, if you didn't structure assembler, <coughs> it could be quite messy to translate. But on a Burroughs, was this a, a, one of the, an algorithm machine or was it an old, a, I'm not familiar with the full, I know Burroughs has some interesting architectures. No, it, 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 this uh, Burroughs was uh, an ASCII machine. It was not uh, Algol. And it was designed around COBOL. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Burroughs did some innovations. and A lot of things in those days, I mean, we look at all the assembler that, you know, did. But what was also is that people were experimenting with architectures. Yeah. Like the Burroughs things, you know, and also, there's all sorts of, I think with the Precambrian explosion of ideas. Because um, I had a textbook on the history of programming languages. I bought some copies recently. It was about an inch thick in 1966. Yeah. So there a lot of ideas, and it's interesting to see which ones survived and which ones have come back. Like Lisp has come back. It's called JavaScript. I didn't know that they were related. What? Oh, I didn't know Lisp was like JavaScript. Well, no. It ha okay, Lisp was followed by Scheme. JavaScript was modeled on Scheme. And then uh, I, I think was told, we can't have all these parents. So then he put a Java-like syntax on top of it to make it friendlier. And one limitation is you don't, you can't, there isn't a reverse. You can't look at the, uh, the JavaScript program in a JavaScript program easily to parse it, but, but that might be coming back. So you will be able to have programs operate on themselves. One, one question I have about JavaScript. So mm -hmm. like in the case of like other parsed um, languages like Python, like you can see memory codes and stuff. Is there some way to see memory uh, allocations in JavaScript or is that kind of masked no, what do you mean by? I'm curious. What do you mean by what, seeing the memory allocation in Python? Um, like, like say if if I call an object, uh, like you know, if, if um, I, I could see the memory address of an object in Python, it does give it to you. Yeah. Okay. Why? Okay. I you know I know you can't answer. I, I, well, to... I, I assume that that Python is giving you enough control of the system that it will show you the memory addresses. Of I think it's more historic artifact. Are... Oh, okay. Because if you look at C sharp, it has both. In other words, you can go to an unsafe mode, pin things to a physical memory address, but that's a transitional form. So the question is, why would you want to look at a memory address in JavaScript? Um, 
yeah, I, I guess it's more of just uh, if I wanted to play around with optimizations. Um, well, that's not the way to optimize. No. You optimize by understanding the algorithm. And once you can pin down the memory limit. So there's a whole discussion of the V8 engine. And one of the historic ideas we, we had in the old days is the machines were very small. So you would pre-compile the programs. You would only load the libraries of things you needed carefully to make sure it all fits in memory. And once you're running, you lost all that. Fortunately, we've grown up. And we compile as just in time, which has a big advantage because you know what's really happening. So the just in time compiler can do better than pre compiled code. For example, if you, one of the problems with programming, you have all these edge cases. Well, if you're doing dynamic compilation, you can see the edge cases aren't there. If the edge case comes up, then the compiler will handle it. Otherwise, you can optimize past it. So a lot of advantages to just in time. And because we have the full facilities available, we can have a lot more flexibility in programming, but it's very hard to you know wrap one mind around it because we're still suffering the trauma of the old days. Just like people are pathologically afraid of null because in C null was so dangerous, but today you know it's it's a very useful out of about uh, you know value it, it, uh, to use. Unfortunately, people have not gotten over the fear of null. Yeah, why why is null an object and not a primitive? Why is well? Why is null an object and not a primitive? Well, it depends on the language, but uh, basically, it's the null object. It's like why is zero not a number? It is a number. And if anything, fear of null and fear of zero are the same. So the people who want to get rid of null should also get rid of zero for math because it's, zero is a real. Well, I, I think that null uh, is is best replaced by by something like uh, an optional type, well, which can be either something or nothing. Yeah, so why not just call um, it null? Why it just changing the name doesn't? Well, no, no, but but an optional type actually contains uh, the type of what what the what it contains, and it's and it, it, it's uh, the the problem with null is when you, when you don't expect it to happen. It's well, not. It, but why is the type intrinsic? Type is not intrinsic. I mean, that's another thing. The whole static type language is what was a, a traumatic phase we went through. Well, I, I don't know. I'm 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 very into Rust, and and Rust is, st is statically typed, and and it, it lets it do some interesting things with, with the compiler and, and optimization and stuff. Yeah, uh, I mean, Rust is a throwback. I can understand some of the use for Rust, and one day I'll, I'll learn it. But right now, um, you know, we're, we're fine without it. Just so you you're right in the sense, no, doesn't know its type, but any type in JavaScript doesn't really know its type. You look it on the ground, what it is. So to have nothing, how many, you know, I have nothing of what is an interesting philosophical question. Well, yeah, and, and it ends up meaning that, like, uh, uh, if you replace null with optional types, uh, then it's just, it, it prevents, there's some really poor design choices that, that, can, that can be, that can come from null. And, and then if you're using someone's library and it uses null in an unexpected place, and it's, it's like, uh, then, then, you know, uh, and you don't expect that an empty text field causes this library to to em emit a null somewhere. Well, and you don't yeah. test that, and then now you have a null somewhere in your application, and, and it just says, uh, and there's just an error referring a null, and it doesn't say, you know. <laughs> but that, that's a general problem of you know traceability. But the flip side is use uh, TypeScript and things like that, which will sort of uh, keep sort of the meta knowledge around at a metal level without having the runtime worry about it. <coughs> but, you know, but if libraries fail, I mean, there are all sorts of things like you pass a minus one to square root, you know, what's going to happen? Okay. okay. Enough okay. learning, enough learning for one night. We're going to have to, uh, okay. Back when I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have to pass the stick to, to the lazy, I think. Cause he yeah, has... I was never a kid. <laughs> he has he has a he has a couple uh i think a lightning talk but maybe a little bit longer either way we'll we'll do him possibly sean nishi and then and then to professor jelinski is brian connected i don't see him in the lister oh bd is brian yeah but can you hear me there oh yeah, yeah. 
Hey, Bob, thank you very much. As always, it's uh, you're an impossible act to follow, and it's it's wonderful just to hear you talk anytime you get the opportunity. So thanks for doing that. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of breeze through some slides here if I can toggle them up onto the screen. Uh, let's see if I start sharing a tab. Maybe it's... Uh, Bob, can you unshare, please? Is he good there? Yeah, we're good. You should be able to share. If you, it's interesting. You can't. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Can you share across browser, um, or did, do the tabs have to be in the same browser? No, no I, I was sharing different windows, so the outside the browser. Gotcha. And there's also I discovered you can share the YouTube. Also has a direct YouTube share. Let's see so. if I can do that that way. Where things are in the user interface is another question, but you can do the stuff. So it's it's actually nice. I'm, uh, this is working much better than it has in the past as I learned more about it. I'm not sure those are my dogs, but uh, that's God knows what we're going to see here. That's... I wonder if I can jump over there. Interesting. Oh, that might be. Uh, hmm. Let me. All right, give me a minute here. I'm going to have to. I got to switch user IDs to make this magic work, I think. That works for okay, let's see. Okay, do you see a slide there now? 15 minutes of fear? Yep, I see it. Great, thanks, sorry about that. So um, ba basically it didn't, for me at least, let me share between two different uh, browser incarnations and 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 stuff. So anyways, the, sl the slide is 15 minutes of fear. Uh, the hunt for virtual gold, which I, I borrowed from uh, Bob's quote there about crypto. Uh, and so what inspired this kind of brief, uh, you know, lightning talk were these two stories, uh, articles, one by Ken Thompson, whom I know everybody is, uh, presume everybody is aware of, and my guess is Bob probably personally knows, uh, and Russ Cox. Uh, Russ Cox, who I think may be somewhat less known, less well known, uh, is, he, he may even be local. Uh, he, he works at Google currently and has been a cornerstone of their, their Golang effort. But has anybody read the Reflections on Trusting Trust article by Thompson? A long time ago. Yeah, I figured Bill would have. It, uh, and it was written, well, it was written a long time ago, August 1984. Bill, this is a challenge. but uh, I, I believe I was in the audience when he won an award for it. He did. He did. And so, so the gist of it basically is that uh, he, 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 you know, uh, he, he talked about 
the challenges of trusting code, what the code does. And of course, some people are better at, at uh, doing wild things with code. But effectively, what this paper is about is going in and not only changing the code to put backdoors into it, but changing the compiler, you know, people were talking about assemblers and, 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 uh, you know, binary code. I mean, you know, Bob probably more than anybody remembers the peak and the poke of the, uh, the, the early days of the apples. But, uh, so, so Thompson talked about the, the risks associated with, you know, and it's kind of, it's kind of coder beware. Uh, so, so this is a, a graphic for anybody. I, I won't, uh, pry, to find out if people actually own crypto, but I presume most people know what crypto uh, currency is. Crypto is a lot of different things, and one of which, uh, in its applied form, is currency. So, or, or pretend currency, or digital gold, or, or, um, anyways, a lot of it has been stolen. A lot of it has disappeared. Um, you know, you, the the fabulous story about the guy who, what did he put up millions of dollars for people to help him find his hard drive because he uh, dumped his hard drive into a uh, you know, kind of a landfill and it had all his magic keys on it too. So this is a bit of a, a lead in prelude to a talk in March about cryptography, uh, tinkering with crypto, and in fact, Google's libraries, which uh, are, are named uh, Tinker. So anyways, over this period of time on the slide, a lot of money has disappeared. And the thing that ought to be uh, visible from these slides is that the frequency and which keep disappearing for me, I don't know if they do for you, um, but th they... Uh, it, the numbers have just grown enormously. So to, to some extent in the context of uh, Thompson and Cox, you know, how do you manage this? So uh, I put this out there. This is just literally the slide on the left is from today. Uh, Fidelity, which is one of the mainstream companies that has actually invested in uh, technology in and around crypto, one of the credible big name firms is just uh, scaling back its investment pretty precipitously. And if you've been following any of that end of the digital currency news, uh, they are not alone. D does anybody know what this, um, the, the event stream uh, hack was? And Bob had mentioned uh, uh, Node and, and, and anyways, the, the brief story of it is that a whole bunch of crypto was, uh, was, was uh, taken from uh, people who had relied on some no JavaScripty stuff, uh, and what happened is, uh, you know, a, a bad hacker worked their way into actually becoming a maintainer on the, you know, the node one of the node libraries that turned out to be critical to this one particular cryptocurrency, and so they went to, you know, this is obviously well planned. Uh, there was a whole buildup. They became the man maintainer, and then they put surreptitiously code in, which only attacked actually the cryptocurrency uh, that this one particular area. Even though this library was used widely, they limited the the hack to just uh, this one code currency application, and also the big accounts. So, <clears throat> anyways, uh, does anybody know what the what FTX is all about? Actually, does anybody know uh, the, the 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 principles in FTX? At least well, one it's of just them. that they took customers' money and then gambled with it through speculation. Uh, for FTX, yeah. Well, so FTX is going through a bankruptcy proceeding right now. Uh, you know, somewhere depending upon as, the as number. Ponzi schemes do. As Ponzi schemes do, right? Bill, Bill is. By the way, I, I haven't put it in the slides because I haven't got Bill's permission. But uh, th there's going to be in March some kind of a Ricker test which is uh, sensibility as to the security and the way this ties in to uh, the, and, you know, when, when Kurt and, and I and Bill and a few other people with the support of, I, of, of uh, TI, uh, you know, did the first IoT Fest, a, a lot of it was about making things small and doing things economically at, at kind of at the, you know, at the edge, at the, uh, and, you know, and Bob gave a presentation, as did others. Uh, what this tie-in is about, and, and Bob kind of referred to it, I think, earlier, was, you know, what happens to the data 
the 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 um, you know the local IoT data when you push it out to the cloud. And anyways, this um, FTX, which was a cryptocurrency firm with you know a number of principals uh, with some form of affiliation to MIT and some local and some West Coast. Anyways, um, it's it's going through bankruptcy right now. A number of the people have already pled guilty and and uh, a few other high profile people are holding out. But if you see in the upper right hand corner, it talks about this uh, in the white block of outside of AWS. Anyways, there were some back doors. And so there were private keys and there were kind of off ledger transactions uh, reported, which could be of, you know, uh, sort of certainly six figures and probably closer to, um, you know, to billion dollars. Okay. So now here's the transition to the IOT angle on this. Let's move to Iowa. So um, I don't know if people know about Google Cloud, but again, the question is, we've well, got all this IOT stuff. Where do you push the data and where do you store the data? And back when we did the IOT Fest, there was really no, I don't know where how big AWS was at the time, but the whole cloud phenomenon has come along since then. Anyways, the uh, the, the the Tau uh, offering from Google Cloud is on ARM servers. And uh, they, in Shanghai probably has ducked off at this point, but uh, the first Tau servers that Google did were actually with AMD. And the, the idea was to come up with higher price performance and energy efficient uh, server offerings in the cloud. And so for everybody to take notice, uh, it, there's a, a terrific free trial available from uh, Google right now. Amper is the people who make these ARM chips that Google has partnered with. I don't know what the overlap is. I'm presuming there is some close uh, confabulation of the, the leadership of these uh, firms. But anyways, for, for, and it's a, a generous uh, credit in terms of dollars and duration, like 90 days. So uh, the, I just signed up for this thing today, basically got the basics up and running, and we'll talk more about this in March. Um, this goes through in, in uh, at a high level. Uh, it does give you a programming software uh, shell coding environment that has kind of uh, reverberations of Microsoft Studio Code stuff. Um, the whole G Cloud thing is a little bit, for me, It you know, there's a lot of overhead, frankly. Uh, if you've used uh, DigitalOcean or some of the other, Vulture, I think is more akin to this. You know, you're, you're more in the realm of SSH and other traditional Linuxy uh, standard tools to, to manage these cloud services. On the other hand, obviously, well, Google Cloud and uh, AWS offer are, is lots of tooling. And I won't get into AWS though, I've used it. And uh, so far the Google Cloud thing is is pretty good. A uh, lot of keys floating around. How do you manage them? When do connections work? Okay, so the other thing, Shankai did sort of the hardware version of you know the different uh, architectural models. And this is how it shows up in software. This is the Golang compiler. Uh, and as you can see, uh, lots of different architecture, hardware architectures, lots of different OS combinations, and pretty remarkable uh, that the stuff all runs. Again, we've got this challenge, I think, of how do you do stuff cross-platform? Uh, you know, this talks about I made some goofs today where I just visually skimmed, and if you see the block that's uh, circled in red, that's framed in red, you see AMD, and of course, coincidentally, it's AMD is the same three-letter spacing is ARM. And so you got to make sure you get the right ones. Uh, this One thing that's really good about Google Cloud, and there's no reason why people shouldn't try this. First of all, it's free. Second of all, they promise that they're not going to charge you in the event that you run over their generous allocation of funds, which is good news. Uh, but additionally, very good online documentation, easily searchable. Uh, and, and okay, Here's the free trial. I'll be honest with you, I still haven't completely figured out if they've got a separate Tau free trial, which is for the ARM-based server nodes. They also, they have, it, you'll come to find out if you've done stuff with the cloud, there's this whole range of hardware you can choose from. 
uh, but uh, the Tao arm offering is basically only available, it seems generally, from the Iowa uh, cloud farm that, that Google has. Um, I'll jump ahead. Uh, you know, for this is the Ubuntu, which again, not only do you have different flavors of chips, but you've got different flavors of operating system. I, I went with both Debian and Ubuntu, but I know people in the group use uh, Red Hat and other things. So they've got a bunch of images, but not every image is available for every uh, hardware. This gives you some pricing information. I haven't done it, but I hope by March to have, we need a configurator uh, that, that helps you project what the cost of your cloud usage is going to be. And, and I'm hopeful I can do this on the Google Cloud stuff. I, I, I was less successful on other platforms. Um, the, the future really is the present is living in the cloud. This, uh, this is just, uh, let's jump ahead. Uh, am I going backwards? Uh, I'll get to, okay. So I, I guess just to kind of call, call it a wrap, if there are any questions, I would be curious if people have tried Google Cloud. Uh, if people are using it currently. And uh, the crypto stuff is in some sense a whole nother thing, but the beauty of, of the software that's available today, it, it, crypto for one is one example, uh, is that people are rolling these things out with uh, JavaScript, with Go, with Rust, with there, there's just really a lot of choices. Um, so a question out to the group, have people used the Google Cloud for experimentation or actual uh, production? Um, I've been using DigitalOcean and I, you inspired me to see if I could spin up something Google Cloud, but I'm trying to figure out how to create an Ubuntu machine. Yeah, it. I mean, I. you know, to me, I, I kind of did, it took me a half a day uh, to, you know, get my way around and what one, and DigitalOcean, Frankly, I probably spun that up more quickly. Uh, you know, some of the differences are uh, Google and AWS, they enforce the firewalling stuff and these other things. Whereas DigitalOcean, you're, you know, you're much closer to metal, as people talked about. You know, you're installing the, so uh, there See, are kind of pros and cons. That's a major feature for me, but I'm running, just want to simple <clears throat> machines for simple purposes. Uh, one of the things, by the way, DigitalOcean offers you is a Mastodon install. I had not seen that. Um, the, the, yeah, as, they, a, as a foot, as they a foot have note, a lot of canned applications that you can just plug in. So yeah, I think what I looked at, like I was originally Microsoft and, and Amazon, and they're far more complicated. Now I don't know where Google is. What I liked about DigitalOcean is you can do simple things simply. Yeah, the, and the other thing is you can get in pretty cheap on the DigitalOcean front, um, and they do have good support for you know uh, out of the box kind of applications as well. Uh, you know, the the once you start dropping on databases and other things, all of these services really start hitting you. Um, the the beauty of and and kind of the bottom line message from the opening slide in all of this is that as, as we all have kind of benefited from the open source world uh, and we, you know, there's a lot more plug and play, whether it's with node or whether it's with uh, libraries, Russ Cox, a lot of the stuff he was talking about was essentially better control of, of your source code. But the problem is every one of those open source libraries that you roll in to your most cherished app really become, you know, vectors of exposure uh, to downstream or upstream uh, hacks, right? So uh, you may not have to worry about that or deal with that if you're just looking to offload IoT data. But, um, but that's kind of the big message, which is how do you protect yourself from, uh, you know, essentially people who are hacking for a living and, uh, you know, if you're not transacting uh, money or virtual gold, maybe it's not a big deal. If all you're tracking are, you know, well, where the cows are going and when, um, maybe you're not going to be as exposed. That's but. a deeper discussion of what kind of attacks you're protected against. Because um, 
and this is a, lo a longer discussion that the problem with the firewalls is once you breach it, you're wide open. Now, by the way, one problem I had was a conference where I was speaking to people about the security issue. And I mentioned the problem. I would joke about how well the Maginot line worked. And then I realized nobody in the room knew what a Maginot line is. How many people on this talk know what the Maginot line is? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I know it too. I yep. know, but the kids yeah. don't. You can't use the reference. So that well, is how... well, and, and unfortunately, it's a dangerous reference because a lot of people think it didn't work and it worked. No, it it, it didn't work. No, it was what made France so vulnerable. Andre Maginot made one strategic. No, thing. no. The problem oh. with it was Belgium didn't build and defend their portion of it and would have gotten offended if France had extended the line behind Belgium. Well, Maginot we could... line worked where it was built. Yeah, well, the, that, the that's tanks a, diverted around it instead of going through it. It worked. Okay. So well, my point is that everybody, including you, gets it wrong. No. Well, okay. Let me just again. That. No. It, it, whether they, it, they of course they went to the weak points. They didn't go directly to the marginal line. Whether it could have worked on their terms then is an open question. But the real failure was depending on it, and and the mistake Andre. No, Mons the failure was depending on Belgium. No, it, 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 no, the real mistake Andre Maginot made was dying. But she said, by the way, you also need an army. This is not a replacement for an army. So the Maginot line created complacency. So whether as a wall it would have worked, we can argue about. The, the, the well, you're, you won't have an argument with me because I won't argue it with somebody who isn't a military historian. Um, but you are correct that the politicians were the failure. You are correct there. So, yeah, so I'm not going to argue whether the line could have worked, but you're right that the complacency was the real problem. So so as far as the, um, you know, this question about open source and how it's used, uh, the Golang language uh, and the development environment, and, and uh, I mean, you see it now in Git, and, you know, everything has their, their, their hashes and they're checking all the SHAs and... Um, there's a lot more uh, focus and energy behind making sure that the stuff that you're editing and changing and uh, re rebuilding, recompiling is predictable and reliable and, and well known. Um, but, but it does come at a cost. And, and so it's just it's probably a cost that people are realizing more presently because of the, you know, essentially the incursion rate into your peace of mind. Uh, through these various hacks that actually have uh, occurred and and are occurring with increasing frequency. Um, okay. But, so, but, but thank you for the time to chat. I appreciate that. So that's all of our scheduled speakers, unless Sean has an update for us. And then we'll, uh, we'll pivot to uh, Professor Jelinski and his students. Do you have anything, Sean? No, he's probably still driving. We'll have to schedule him in for next time. All right. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, you're up. Um, so, uh, Jerry, is it okay if we turn off recording for the students? Because they might be using this material in their classes. Yeah, I'm wondering if Jerry fell asleep. He doesn't seem responsive right now. No, I didn't. Somehow I couldn't uh, get my system back online here. Um, 